Okay, remember that they are changing my voice. The Bible is figurative. Bear with me, I'll prove it definitively, I promise you. The Bible is written figuratively. So it is made clear in Genesis with God's Spirit hovering over the waters. We'll get to that. It's also made clear in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John, which is a New Testament book, is making it clear that the formula that's being used in explaining the story, keep in mind this is not a parable, it's the formula that is being used in explaining the story, is figurative speaking. Again, I tell you, John is making clear that the formula that's being used to explain things in the Bible is figurative. In the beginning was the Word, right? The Bible's not written yet. People aren't speaking. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So there's a comparison being made here. Why is it called the Word? Why isn't it just called God or God's actions or God's essence or God's spirit? Why is it called the word? And the word word is like the word sword. And the word name for the name of God scrambled is mean. And we see this being used again and again, that there are cryptograms like Leb Kamai and Rahab being used to refer to Babylon and Egypt and so on and so forth. So we know definitively, beyond a reasonable doubt, there's no other way it could be, that the Bible is figurative. Let's see what Jesus as a character in the story has to say about it, shall we? In John 16, going down to verse 25, John 16, 25, it says, Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language but will tell you plainly about my father. Again, though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my father. I'm telling you plainly now. Okay, we see in Revelation where it says that the prostitute sitting by many waters and the water stands for the peoples, nations, multitudes, and languages. Languages. So what, how you interpret the Bible, okay, and what it's saying is key in whether you're with the prostitute and the beast and the Antichrist, etc., or whether you're with God. That's key. You might say, well, man, that's difficult. How do I know? Well, one of the most important scriptures in the Bible, in many ways is the most important, is Isaiah 28, 17. Write that down and put it on your wall. I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plume line. Hail will sweep away your refuse to lie and water will overthrow your hiding place. So if it's righteous and just, okay, you know, that's why my religion is universal pinpoint and moral precision. It's not republicanism or being a Democrat or a libertarian. It's not being an occult. It's not a black supremacist. I'm a moral supremacist. I interpret this in a morally precise way. Moral, mental, spiritual, and romantic precision and prowess and intensity and might are connected. In Proverbs 16, 12, it says the throne is established in righteousness. So that's how you know how to interpret it. When you hear what I'm saying, know that it's morally precise. And if you think that it's not, by all means, question me. You know, ask me questions. Let's discuss this. Okay? I always try to hear what other people have to say to make sure that I'm correct. And I assure you, this is correct. So... Now let's let's look at some examples here to overkill this. In case any of you have any questions, let's go to Genesis one two. Okay, so for, excuse me, in John one one, we see that it's clear in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In Genesis, how it starts, okay, the first book in the Bible, Genesis one, verse two it says, "Now the earth was formless and empty; darkness was over the surface of the deep." And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Okay. So the waters stands for the Spirit. Okay. How do we know? Let's go to John 7, 38. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. So Jesus is saying flat out. Okay. This is something he's saying. 
So sometimes it's in the narration, right? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And there's some, sometimes he's saying it flat out, okay? Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit. Flat out, the narrator then says, by this he meant the Spirit. Now why is it explaining it and sometimes it's not? Well, there's a book of Proverbs. Proverbs says it's there in, in chapter 1 to help you understand the riddles, the parables, and sayings of the wise. So it's giving you a formula. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. It's giving you a formula to decode the formula and to see what is being meant in any given part. Okay, so write down Proverbs 1, write down Genesis 1, uh, verse 2, write down John 1, 1, and write down Isaiah 28, 17. And you'll see that my argument is sound, open and shut. So let's go to John 6, 63. The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Okay, so the words are full of spirit. So in the beginning was the Spirit, and the Spirit was with God, and the Spirit was God. Okay. Now, let's go back to John 7. Let's go to verse, uh, um, let's see here. Okay, back to verse 39. I didn't finish the verse. I'm sorry. I didn't finish the verse, but it's it's you'll see what I mean so, shortly. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So how is he glorified? Let's go back to Genesis 1-2 and let's figure it out, right? Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Where was it? Over the waters. So you've got to put God first so God can reign. That's why the word R-A-I-N is like the word R-E-I-G-N because it's the reign of God. So we know the water is spirit. So it's the Spirit of God hovering over the spirit of the earth. Okay, and the Spirit means life and righteousness and so on and so forth. So, in order for your spirit, the human spirit, your group, you as an individual, what have you, to receive the Spirit of God, you have to obey the commands of God. You have to give God His rightful place. That means giving me my rightful place, and you're not doing that. That's a story for another day. So let's go to Psalm 104, too, and let's wrap this up here. I'll make some sequels here. We're, you know, well, we'll wrap this up here with the figurative and fig wordplay. We'll get to that in a second. Psalm 104, 2. The Lord wraps himself in light as with, an, with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent. God lays the beams of his upper chambers on the waters. Do you see a literal? Do you see literally, um, you know, some kind of palace in the sky or over the ocean or, you know, with the rain clouds? No. That's not what it's talking about. So it's speaking about this, again, in a way that's figurative. He makes the clouds his chariot, flat out, boom. It tells you he makes the clouds his chariot. Are the clouds in the sky the chariot of God? Well, why not the trees? Why not, you know, the sun? Why not, you know, the moon? Why not the stars? Why not, you know, because it's figurative. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. Does the wind have wings? No. He makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. Okay, so are the prophets merely the wind? No. Not literally. The prophets and the angels, okay, are with God, right? They, 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 what they're saying is figurative. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. So in the essence of the prophet and the angels comes the message. And the angels do not literally appear. And that's a story for another day. He makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. Okay, so you see the flood, right? There was, there was some kind of disruption in the air when the earth was flooded, figuratively speaking. You know, when it talks about in Isaiah 34, how... God's going to bring in Isaiah 30, um, burning sulfur, you know, the lake of burning sulfur. Okay. The breath of, okay. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of burning sulfur sets it ablaze from Isaiah 30. Okay. We see that th these things are being used figuratively. The whole earth isn't going to be covered with burning sulfur. Literally. It's going to be covered with burning sulfur uh, figuratively and to some degree it already is. Okay. This is a bit more confusing. If you have any questions about that, put in the comments, because as we start to use the formula to decode, because I'm telling you, 
I'm proving to you that there's a formula here and it's figurative. Now, once we start t- talking about how to apply it, that's a whole nother story. It takes a profound kind of ability to sense things and understand things to truly sink your teeth into it. You can kind of see what I'm saying, but you're not going to exactly see what I'm saying. And it goes back to the fig tree in um, Genesis. Okay, Adam and Eve, you know, weren't supposed to kind of listen to the serpent and they did. And they started using the fig leaves from the fig tree. And we see in Revelation and elsewhere that the figs can also stand for stars. And we see in the Old Testament it can also stand for fortresses, etc. So it's what you rely on, what your stronghold is, what you believe is talents, are talents that people have, what spirit you believe is superior, what have you, what you trust in, what you find reliable. That's why the word figurative is like the word figure. My right? mind, body, soul, spirit in martial arts, right? And figure it out. Figurative, figured out, body figure, a holy figure, a divine figure. Okay, so if you wish to explore more about the clouds and the water, I'll probably make another video, but put it in the comments, okay? It's a very complex idea. It has to do with drawing on the spirit of God and conveying the message. It has to do with what they're comparing uh, God's presence to the righteous who are drawing on the Spirit of God. Now, I want you to leave you with this thought here. In Revelation, it says, Outside the gates are the sorcerers. This is not a sorcerer's book, a wizard's book, or a witch's book. In Exodus 15 3, the second book of the Bible, it says, The Lord is a warrior, the Lord is his name. Now, the Lord isn't Conan the Barbarian, or Genghis Khan, or, or Hulk Hogan, or John Jones. The Lord is an Afro Asiatic martial artist right and with the afro heavy right god through the african martial arts system through the middle east is the argument that the bible's making ham begot kush kush begot nimrod nimrod was a mighty warrior before the lord and abraham was born in babylon where nimrod had founded had made a civilization out of a bunch of huts right and actually made it great okay and uh abraham was from chaldea or Ur in babylon abraham okay is real okay and so we see that that is the divine order and the argument that's being made here is that the children of you know the people of abraham went astray the people of abraham uh, uh excuse me the people of nimrod which is not the same as cush or ham the people of nimrod went astray well also the abraham too we'll get to that later in another video i'm way over time here the people of nimrod went astray ham begot cush cush begot nimrod camrod be, uh, uh, excuse me cush bore good fruit the cush in its true form is a good tree that bore good fruit nimrod is like cain and abel right he went away astray from that tree and therefore became rotten and didn't bear good fruit and any branch that doesn't bear good fruit is cut off and thrown in the fire so the assyrians and the people of nimrod who went astray after nimrod had passed as an individual king as an individual monarch who was a mighty warrior before the lord okay then we see the people in the area abraham and his people there they're set in the story okay in the story which is figurative to begin with okay you got to look for righteousness and justice everywhere okay they're said to have gone astray Isaiah 1, and we can go on and on, Isaiah 58, on and on and on, many, many, all Jeremiah, you name it. They go astray. And so when it's talking about a remnant, it's talking about a remnant of the righteous. Galatians um, 3.28, there's no Jew or Gentile. You're all one in Christ Jesus. So you look for righteousness everywhere, the remnant of the righteous. And they're taken out of this world, heaven and earth pass away, okay, and they go with God. And this world transforms into hell. That's why, that's why in Revelation there's trumpets that's blown. There's bowls that are pouring on, onto the ground, right? Onto the, into the waters as well. Because it's like, a, it's like sorcerers. It's being handed over to sorcerers to abuse people dumb enough to keep reproducing and to re- abuse their offspring and so on and so forth. People dumb enough to rebel against God. So really quickly, they're fuming me and changing the sound of my voice. People who are racial supremacists, they should realize that they're better off with me in charge than the governing class. The governing class has made your life a lot harder than I would. I would make things right. I would end homelessness. People would get paid fairly. I'd restructure the school system. There wouldn't be a single race or group that wouldn't be happy with my governance. So it's stupid to look at this and to say to yourself that somehow you're magically helping your kids magically by suppressing me. That's not the case. 
You're making it worse for yourselves and your races and your offspring by suppressing me. The devil has convinced you to look toward the flesh to try to find your life in the world instead of to listen to my reason, which is the reason of God, which is true reason, universally sound reason, universal pinpoint and moral precision, focus moral intensity. Those things are my religion. And those things bring the blessings of God and not the laughable kind of beta, kind of silly, kind of brute things of the devil. So you see, either I point this out or I don't do God and humanity justice. To their extreme disgrace, they've changed the sound of my voice and trying to make it so I sound corny and like a ghetto preacher or something at times. Okay, just ignore that and know that that's their insecurity. That's some kind of inferiority complex that they have. They don't want to accept that God chose me as the top martial arts ever, as the greatest king ever possible, as the last valid king possible. 